Some things are supposed to be a secret, kept from people and left to fester in the dark. One of these secret things had gained the ability to look into the world. It watched and bided its time. It smiled in the darkness as much as it could be described as doing so, drawn in an inescapably was, smelling the vulnerability. Look, you cannot keep on like this forever. He would have wanted you to carry on and live your life. You have so much time left. The voice was falsely honeyed and told her all the platitudes and helpful advice people think they need to give out. Advice that is not sought from those grieving. Rachel had not expected this from her mother of all people. The phone carried on making noises and at some point, without realizing it, she had turned off the invasive little plastic glass box. 32. 32 and a fucking widow. Rachel wanted to throw something, to beat the walls, and to wail to show anger and rage, but she could not. She had never felt anything apart from sadness and the yawning maw of depression. She was listless and despairing. They had moved out together, her and Michael, only a year ago, to leave the States and surrender themselves to Spain, the land she had fallen in love with during their time in college. Michael was the guy she asked to go with, and he did just that. Went. Simply because it was what she wanted, not so much as a question or a doubt in his mind. That cough, when it arrived, was innocuous. It was more of a throat-clearing sound, really. Family and friends had said on their photos that he looked tired and could do with some fattening up on good Spanish food and cheap Spanish wine. They had giggled at that. She remembered wrapping herself up in his arms, hoping for the warmth and vitality he had possessed as they posed for an ironic selfie. Her hopes were left unfulfilled. He had felt hollow. Within two months of that, she remembered a distorted facsimile of that particular image. He was now wrapped in wires and tubes. Things beeped in a sterile room. She could not even hold his hand without putting on gloves and scrubbing up. The cancer had killed him. First his immune system, then his humanity. Each day that passed, he thinned, stretched out, and became more corpse-like. She could not visit the last two weeks, bear to look at him in the eye. Michael passed alone and in pain because she could not deal with it. A letter had been left for her. It remained unopened, not even hidden in a drawer. Rachel left it out on the kitchen table, a paper monolith, testament to her guilt. She had printed out photos and stuck them around the apartment, all the ones where she and Michael looked happy and he looked alive. The sadness and waves of guilt suddenly crippled her, and she collapsed on a heap on the floor. She clutched at the nearly empty green bottle and reached for a cigarette. The box was empty, so she picked up a remnant of one from the terracotta tile floor and lit the nub. Ironic how short it was. Ironic as it reflected the time she had with Michael. He had died alone. She asked herself again how she could have been so cold. Days passed without any change of feeling. Days and days and days. The crippling despair hit Rachel one evening, harder than most. For most of the bad days, well, all days, she could function enough to work, to write for a local English-American website about living in Spain. It really pained her to write five to seven hundred words every day about local customs and how to survive. At least it covered the rent, and enough so she could live on the calories and alcohol. Fuck it, she declared to herself and switched off the laptop. She giggled morosely and looked at the keys. From a furred brain, she remembered something about a board game and contacting the dead from one of those campy 80s movies. She'd really never cared for them. She prodded at the letter Y, heard the click as plastic moved spring. She held her hands over the keyboard, eyes half closed, waiting for some unseen force to come calling. If you can hear me, 
soft voice slightly slurring. My, Michael, I am... She was weeping now. Rachel moved her hands in front of her, tipping a glass. Its contents spilled, shattering into wicked, glistening teeth. Instinctually moving her hand to clean the mess, she gently lacerated the tips of three fingers. She could not finish the apology. She felt bile moving into her throat and ran into the nearest waterproof container. Fortunately, this time, a sink. Had this not happened, Rachel might have felt the subtle tug on her forefinger, directing her old laptop's keyboard. She might have noticed the iridescent drops of blood seep into the keys and disappear. She tended her gentle wounds and fell asleep. Something that lived in the dark corners of the world moved seamlessly. A fluid, malevolent thing. Rachel awoke to the sound of something buzzing in the background. Her phone had been alive during the warm evening and showed a glint of messages and calls that she could not be bothered to answer or respond to. She walked over to her laptop to get her workday over and done with, to get back to focusing on missing him. She did not even bother to look at herself in the mirror, brush her teeth, or do anything except to reach for a cigarette. She smiled briefly at a warm memory as her hands caressed a matchbox. It was one he had brought for her, a replica of those old ones called Lucifer's Matches. He had made it by hand and gifted it to her for her birthday. His little sinner, he called her. The smile remained as the memory faded. It turned bitter, like coffee grounds left too long in a hot water. The cigarette drooped in her mouth, leaving her with one smoldering and an elongated canine that she stared at her laptop. Some of the keys were removed and left on the table. I see you, Rage. Michael. She stood there, mouth agape, until the smoke irritated her left eye, making it weep. The other hand had followed suit without the smoke. She immediately felt anger. Some bastard had... While she was finishing the thought, she glanced around the small apartment. Windows still fastened, and the door bolted. No one had come in. She felt a tangle of movement down her spine, exactly the way Michael had used to run his fingers along the back of her neck, mixing the tingling with something more sensual. It was only brief, but she had known it had been there. In the midst of wonder, she did not feel the thin beating line, more subtle than a scalpel's caress along her back. She waited by the chair next to the window, closed to blot out the sound of life and vitality going on below her in the first floor window. The pleasant heat of the autumnal Spanish sun had become stifling, but she sat there, drinking and smoking, and waiting. It must have been Michael. He was trying to get a message through to her. He once mocked her for the little candles, in semi-precious stones, she said she could channel things to her. It was finally real. The harmless trinkets and the rituals she had picked up on her visits to Egypt and to Europe. Michael, she remembered, had always been such a dick about it. She even convinced him, not long before the end, to try something. They sat in the small living room, candle burning, and crystals aligned the way she thought she remembered they should be. Part way through... Michael had blurted out, If there's anything here, please come get me. Ruining the incantation, and he came over to her kissing her neck, and they ended up, well, doing what young grown-ups do by candlelight. That break in concentration did not seem much, but all something needs is a partial opportunity, an invitation made and unknowingly accepted. As she fell asleep in his arms that night, her fingers traced several thin lines across his back. She had not remembered being so deep in the throes of, well, grown-up things. She did not give it a second thought. Her phone flashed to being alive again, and she read the caller's name, Richard, and immediately switched it off. He was the worst, always telling her about the life hereafter and not taking no for an answer. She needed to think about something else than that seemingly benevolent bastard. She wondered, not without a grin, how long it would be before he was caught out by someone and ended up in social pariah. 
No, she thought, not him. Never him. He was too careful in all of his dealings. She had done well to avoid him. From the recesses of the room, the presence waited again. It knew it had found a way in, the last time, with the man. It had tried to physically manifest within him, choking the body's cells as it tried to rip its way into reality. No, that had not worked. It had liked the reaction in the female, the crying and tears. It instinctually knew she was vulnerable and knew it could take a more methodical approach. It was learning. It manipulated her delicately. She believed it was the man who was in contact. It had managed to shift her reality, so she did not notice the increasing signatures it left on her skin, furrowing ruins and marking along her body. Rachel caught sight of herself, true self, for only a moment and reacted like you would think someone was in the corner of a room with you. Flesh hung from her gaunt face. She moved slowly like an old man with arthritis. And the moment it took to register, a sound came from the bathroom, glass breaking. It sounded too violent to have fallen naturally. She glanced away from the mirror, reflection immediately forgotten. She had not noticed the swell of her belly as something began to grow, something that was not benign. She was isolating herself, shutting out the world. If she had been a mammal, dog, cat, even a mouse, the behavior would be called nesting. All it would take now was time. It had laid the foundations for plenty of that. Something within it flexed, and it knew that it had sown seeds, sown a very particular seed. Time had passed, as it always does. The Spanish landlord first opened the door to the apartment on the first floor. Upon entering, he said something in Latin, that even the uninitiated sounded like a desperate prayer, the bile rising in his throat. He saw things he could not comprehend, would never want to comprehend. At least he had not turned the light on, so most of the scene was in the shadows. It was, however, enough. He turned back to drink after being sober for over ten years. Booze killed him within a month, or so people thought. He remained tight-lipped about what had happened even until the end. He had not even called the police, merely locked the door. He did not know what else to do. As he lay dying, he thought he felt the tracing of fingers along his side. Something bubbled within him. Something more than just liquids from the tubes that pumped things into him to keep him alive a little longer than he should have been. He could not scream. His eyes rolled and a monotone warning burst through the silence. People ran to him. In the darkened corners of the room, a being watched, no longer needed to bide its time. It smelled vulnerability all over this world. Now it was taking form. Two hundred subscribers, that is pretty dang cool. I wouldn't have been here without your love and your support, so thank you for liking what I do and continuing to listen to my ramblings. I also want to give a special shout out to Magpie Stories, who reached out to me specifically for this video. I'm really proud to be a part of this community, and I thank you for welcoming me with open arms. If this is your first time to my channel, welcome, and thank you for checking out what I do. If you don't mind, maybe consider hitting that subscribe button down below. And also, smash the hell out of that like button. Thank you, my frightmares. And I'll catch you on the next one. Bye, guys.